Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Hello and welcome to my talk. My name is Thomas Dixon and I'm very grateful to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh uh, for inviting me to give this talk. It's entitled Dr. Thomas Brown, Inventor of the Emotions. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you who Thomas Brown was and why I think he's particularly interesting. Now, there's uh, three parts to my talk. Uh, First of all, meet Dr. Thomas Brown. I'm going to explain who he was. Secondly, inventing the emotions. What do I mean by that? Uh, and thirdly, uh, a bit of a broadening out to some contemporary issues about emotions, whether emotions are illnesses or not, and the difference between those categories. So first of all, who was Dr. Thomas Brown? Now, the first thing to clear up is who he was not. This uh, is Sir Thomas Brown with an E, who he is occasionally confused with, but um, that is not who I'm talking about today, not the uh, author of the Religio Medici. So that red cross uh, gets him out of the way. Uh, so who am I talking about? I'm talking about this uh, chap here, uh, the youngest of 13 children of the Reverend Samuel Brown and Margaret Smith. Uh, Thomas was born in 1778 and as was not particularly unusual at the time, as a very young man, aged 14 or 15, he started his studies at Edinburgh University. He attended lectures in a range of subjects, moral philosophy lectures by Dougal Stewart, he originally was studying for law but then um, changed direction and ultimately ended up studying medicine. When he was still only about 18, he wrote uh, his first uh, famous work, a lengthy critique of the author Erasmus Darwin. Uh, that book was published in 1798 as the Observations on the Zoonomia of Erasmus Darwin. Uh, Erasmus Darwin, of course, was Charles Darwin's grandfather. He was an Edinburgh physician, philosopher, and poet, like Thomas Brown himself, uh, and the Zoonomia was a, a work of poetry and metaphysics, uh, which was very controversial, and Thomas Brown attacked it for its uh, apparent materialism. So that gained him the nickname of Darwinian Brown uh, and got him well known around the university. In 1802-3, uh, that was an important year for him. He finally finished his medical studies. He wrote a dissertation on sleep. Uh, in the medical faculty and got his MD uh, and then he was also part of a, a group of young men who founded the what became legendary Edinburgh Review, uh, a, a journal of, of literature and ideas for which he wrote uh, several articles including an important early article on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Going forward a couple of years he became involved in a university controversy which was known of uh, which was known as the Leslie Affair about Professor John Leslie. I won't try and explain all the ins and outs of that controversy, but uh, for reasons which you can find out more about uh, by reading more if you would like, uh, this incident led Thomas Brown to write a pamphlet about the philosophy of cause and effect. Uh, and this pamphlet went through several editions and eventually became quite a large book in its final form in 1818 about the relationship of cause and effect. Uh, and historians of philosophy uh, consider this an important book as it's the first one which states the true Humean uh, position on cause and effect. Now I'll just pause for a second to explain what that means. Uh, David Hume is often considered to be the originator of the idea that there is nothing more to cause and effect than uniform uh, temporal succession. Event A is always followed by event B and that's all we mean by cause and effect. Now Hume scholars tend to say that wasn't exactly Hume's position. However it was uh, our man Thomas Brown's position. So he in a way was the first true Humean on cause and effect uh, and his view was influential on other important philosophers including John Stuart Mill. So 
So just carrying on quickly with this potted biography of Brown, um, he, after he finishes his studies, goes into medical practice with James Gregory, MD. Uh, and then a few years after that, multi-talented man, he is appointed jointly with Dougal Stewart, who had been in the post for some time, but, become, but had become unwell. He's appointed Professor of Moral Philosophy at Edinburgh, and that's a post that he holds for what turns out to be the last 10 years uh, of his life, um, and which he throws himself into um, with huge, huge energy. Um, in his first year in the post, he wrote and delivered 100 lectures. And for any of, anyone who, like me, is in the business of delivering and writing academic lectures, it's quite astonishing um, level of work. 100 lectures, which are calculated to be about half a million words. That, and he wrote these all down. Um, we, the, the, the manuscripts of, of many of them survive. And he delivered those 100 lectures in his first year. Um, the, the writer Thomas Chalmers, the evangelical um, theologian and writer Thomas Chalmers later wrote that, that Thomas Brown had got these lectures up with something like the power and speed of magic. He continued to write poetry as well, which is another one of his interests, although most biographers and critics have tended to think that his philosophy was, was more successful uh, than his poetry. Um, but he, he wrote a work, for example, called The Paradise of Coquettes, which was uh, positively reviewed in the Edinburgh Review. And now reaching the end of this um, potted life of Brown, he collapsed uh, with, with illness while lecturing uh, towards the end of 1819 and uh, was sent by his doctors to England for a change of air and a change of scene, um, but that didn't have the desired effect. And he died um, on the 2nd of April, 1820, at the age of only 42. Uh, his main work, the Lectures on the Philosophy of the Human Mind, based on those university lectures he'd been given for 10 years, um, was published posthumously uh, in 1820. And it was immediately very successful. It went through many editions, uh, the 20th edition coming out uh, in 1860. The historian of Scottish philosophy, James McCosh, uh, gives us a sense of the huge popularity of Thomas Brown's lectures. Uh, McCosh wrote, A course so eminently popular among students had not, I rather think, been delivered in any previous age in the University of Edinburgh, and has not in a later age been surpassed. His lectures were published shortly after his death, and excited an interest wherever the English language is spoken, quite equal to that awakened by the living lecturer among the students of Edinburgh. They continued for 20 years to have a popularity in the British dominions and in the United States, greater than any philosophical work ever enjoyed before. During these years, most students were introduced to metaphysics by the perusal of them, and attractive beyond measure did they find them to be. The writer of this article, James McCosh, will give much to have revived within him the enthusiasm which he felt when he first read them. And there are quite a lot of accounts uh, like this of the huge popularity and uh, joy that people found in reading Brown's lectures, which had a big impact. Um, Thomas Brown's grave is now in uh, disrepair. This is um, this is it. There's some nice photographs taken by Robert McQuiston, um, a local historian in Scotland in the area, and it shows uh, the family grave, the parents and um, children buried together in that beautiful spot, uh, but in a state of disrepair. And there is no monument uh, to Thomas Brown other than this. Uh, some years ago, um, or maybe last year, there was a, a craze for, for sort of animating historical photographs and, and turning them into, into videos. And I just thought I'd share with you um, the one that I created for Thomas Brown, which actually gave me quite a, a, a thrill and slightly emotional feeling when I, when I first saw it. So let's just see if this works. There he is blinking and smiling at us uh, from across the centuries. Um, and you can have a lot of fun with your own uh, family photos, putting them into that uh, software. Anyway, there we go. That is Thomas Brown uh, looking back at us. If you'd like to know more about the, the life and writings of Thomas Brown, there's a few places that you can go. Uh, I have produced a, an edited selection of his writings if you don't want to take on the massive uh, sort of multi-volume works. Uh, with an introduction to, to Thomas Brown's life. Um, and also there's a chapter about him in this edited book about Scottish philosophy in the 19th and 20th centuries, edited by Gordon Graham. So that's an introduction to 
the life of Thomas Brown. Now, um, why do I call him the inventor of the emotions? What is his role in relation to this category of the emotions? Well, first of all, let's think about um, what happened before uh, Thomas Brown. So before the emotions became a psychological category, um, sort of strong feelings were categorized in a range of different ways. They might have been called appetites. Um, appetites were like uh, lust, also physical appetites of hunger and thirst, uh, quite basic animal urges. Then there were the passions of the soul. This was the major category from the ancient philosophy onwards, uh, passions of, of, of joy and despair and hatred and love and, and all the rest. Uh, these tended to be, when they were differentiated from other feelings, the passions tended to be stronger. You might have gusts of passion, which were, which were quite strong, potentially sinful forces. Then we have at the other end of the spectrum, the affections and sentiments, um, affections for family, moral sentiments, aesthetic sentiments, more refined feelings, ones that tended to be more approved of. In both uh, classical Stoic uh, philosophy and in Christian theology, um, the passions tended to be seen to be in quite a strong conflict with both uh, reason and secondly, also with virtue. So the passions were a problem uh, very often. The appetites and passions, the lusts um, of the hum human flesh and of the lower soul were seen to be in conflict with the higher powers of the soul of intellect and morality. So that's a sort of, sort of big picture that, that the emotions came into and changed. Now, the word emotion also existed before the emotions were a psychological category. Um, it came into English from the French émotion um, from the late 16th century onwards, we can find uses. And in English, an emotion was a sort of physical disturbance. You might have an emotion in the leaves of a tree when the wind went through it, or you might have an emotion among the people, meaning a, a kind of riot. So an emotion was a bit like a commotion um, in, in modern English before it became what it means uh, post uh, 19th century. One of the earliest uses of emotion in English uh, comes in this text, which I have a picture of here, uh, the English translation of Montaigne's essays by uh, Florio, published in 1603. So that's before uh, the emotions. Then during the 18th century, um, there's a lot of kind of a semantic change and gradual evolution. And we find philosophical writers more often using emotion in a psychological sense and a sense that we would start to recognize a, as a modern one. So the philosopher David Hume, I've already mentioned, he was an early user of emotion as a sort of stylistic variant for passion and other feeling words. So for Hume, the passions is the dominant category, but he will say an emotion or the emotions from time to time although the, the the meaning of it is not systematic and the meaning of it is not 100 percent clear this experimentation with different vocabulary for feeling um, accelerated towards the end of the 18th century um, and for example in april 1797 the philosopher um, and husband of mary wollstonecraft uh, william godwin wrote to thomas wedgwood and complained of the latter's adoption of the categories notions and emotions um, as mental categories. William Godwin wrote, I have a great objection to a new, new, to a new nomenclature in treating an old science where it can be avoided. So for him, emotions and notions were new names that weren't needed um, uh, in mental science. And I've put here a picture of Rachel Hewitt's book, um, A Revolution of Feeling, The Decade That Forged the Modern Mind. That's about the impact of um, the French Revolution and other events on changing ideas about feelings and emotions in the 1790s. And that's where I found this, um, this example of William Godwin and Thomas Wedgwood. So now we come to the key moment, which is Thomas Brown um, in his lectures on the philosophy of the human mind, uh, really cementing the category of the emotions as a central part of his psychology and my suggestion is although this is up for debate you know that he is the first person systematically to do this and that the huge influence of his lectures which we've already heard a little bit about uh, meant that this way of thinking about the mind which he divided into sensations emotions and thoughts was 
um, it was he who gave us that way of thinking which which took on such importance later in the 19th century. Now when Thomas Brown introduces the emotions um, he says the exact meaning of the term emotion it is difficult to state in any form of words and we've been living with the consequence of that uh, ever since. Perhaps he went on if any definition of them be possible they may be defined to be vivid feelings arising immediately from the consideration of objects perceived or remembered or imagined or imagined or from other prior emotions. So he ducks really the question of defining emotions. He says you know one if you have one um, and it's a vivid feeling which is different from a purely physical sensation in that it is um, a, it arises from perception or memory or another emotion. Uh, so I then have a very simplistic uh, diagram showing roughly what happened in the middle of the 19th century with our English language psychological categories. These ones that existed before that I talked about, the ap appetites of the body, the passions of the soul, the moral and social affections, all get subsumed within this big category of the emotions. Uh, and Thomas Brown was one of the most important figures uh, in making that transition happen. Another very important figure though who I want to mention at this point as one of the sort of co-inventors of the emotions is Charles Bell, another Edinburgh physician, uh, although one who moved to, to London relatively early in his career. Uh, uh, and he wrote the series of essays on the anatomy and philosophy of expression. He was an artist as well as a physician. He, he produced his own illustrations of um, uh, the, the human face and body under the grip of certain uh, passions. We have rage um, in the in the middle there, mania on the left, and then a very extraordinary illustration of a fawn weeping, which was the image he used to illustrate tears and crying. Uh, so Charles Bell was was another key figure in the creation of this concept of emotions. Uh, his essays went through several editions between 1806 and 1844. He put particular emphasis on the body. So in Thomas Brown we have the creation of the emotions as a philosophical and psychological category. It's a very capacious category of feelings. In Sir Charles Bell we have the philosophy of expression taking, uh, taking root and a huge emphasis on the importance of the body, especially the lungs uh, and respiration uh, and the face on shaping emotional experience physiologically. And these lectures were of huge importance uh, to Charles Darwin as he developed his thought on the topic of the expression of the emotions. Now Charles Darwin also has an Edinburgh connection as you may well know. He was a medical student uh, at Edinburgh in the 1820s as a very young man uh, and as you also will know he, his studies changed direction. He decided medicine wasn't for him uh, and he went off to Cambridge and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, he specialised in natural history, went on his voyage on the Beagle and so on. Um, but Darwin was very influenced by Charles Bell and when he came to write his book The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals in the 1870s um, Bell was a, an important reference point and uh, a theoretical guide to Darwin in thinking about the expression of the emotions. Darwin, like Bell, put a lot of emphasis uh, on the body as being um, crucial to defining and shaping emotions. And just one more Edinburgh connection for you. William James, the American uh, philosopher and psychologist, again a medically trained man, uh, delivered his legendary Gifford lectures, which became the book The Varieties of Religious Experience in the University of Edinburgh. And uh, in those lectures he recalled the glories of the philosophic chair of this university, Edinburgh, uh, were deeply impressed on my imagination in boyhood. Hamilton's own lectures were the first philosophic writings I ever forced myself to study and after that I was immersed in Dougal Stewart and Thomas Brown. Such juvenile emotions of reverence never get outgrown and I confess that to find my humble self promoted from my native wilderness to be actually for the time an official here and transmuted into a colleague of these illustrious names carries with it a sense of dreamland quite as much as of reality. So Charles Darwin and William James, two of the most important theorists of the psychology of emotions at the end of the 19th century, both have these links back to Edinburgh to Charles Bell in Darwin's case and to Thomas Brown uh, in William James's case. 
So uh, to summarize this point, um, I have suggested that not only was Thomas Brown the inventor of the emotions, but Edinburgh uh, was the seat of the emotions. Uh, for centuries, theorists have debated whether the true seat of the emotions is the soul or the body, the heart or the brain. But in view of um, what I've just told you about Edinburgh, I would suggest that the true seat of the emotions was in fact the University of Edinburgh. I've put there circa 1820 in a nod to the importance of the lectures uh, of Dr. Thomas Brown. So to summarise um, the significance of the emergence of the emotions in the 19th century, I've suggested here there are four uh, main points. Uh, firstly, it was a very homogenous uh, category blurring previous distinctions, for example, between passions and appetites on the one hand and affections and sentiments on the other. Now we have this massive um, overarching category of the emotions, which makes it harder perhaps to, to be more refined about what we are saying about different types of feelings. They're all emotions. Secondly, and importantly, and I'm going to say a bit more about this in the final part of my lecture, um, it lacked the sense of pathology built into the concept of passions. The passions of the soul, I've already said, were a worry. They were a disease. They were pathological disease in a metaphorical sense, you know, diseases of the soul or the mind. Some people called them, the Stoics called them that. They have both a moral uh, and to some extent a sort of medical uh, and mental pathology built into them. They're, they're a threat to reason and to virtue. And the emotions didn't quite have that connotation, certainly doesn't have that connotation today. Thirdly, as we've seen from the outset, the emotions were impossible to define. Thomas Brown said you can't really define them. Um, they're vivid feelings of a, of a, of a certain kind. Uh, and fourthly, uh, the most influential early theorists of the emotions in the 19th century tended to treat them as firstly non-cognitive feelings. So they're vivid feelings rather than something um, uh, cognitive. And secondly, put a lot of emphasis on their grounding in the body. And again, this is quite different from most theories of passions and affections that have gone before. So those are the four um, sort of big changes that the invention of the emotions um, brought with it. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I have written a whole book uh, called From Passions to Emotions. Uh, and if you want a much uh, quicker and easier version of, of the story, there is an open access, very short article called Emotion, the History of a Key Word in Crisis, uh, published in Emotion Review some years ago, which gives you some of the key points of what I've just been talking about. Uh, another interesting footnote to, to this is that just uh, yesterday evening uh, I was tweeted by the editor of Emotions, History, Culture and Society to tell me they have an article coming out which argues that Thomas Brown was not the first to invent the emotions. So um, I'll be interested to see what that has to say uh, and to see whether I can defend my thesis in the light of this new article. So I'm looking forward to that. And that brings me to the third and final part of my talk, which is entitled Emotions Are Not Illnesses or Are They? And this is where I want to open things up to the present day and also to invite you to contribute questions and ideas uh, uh, about this. Uh, my interest in this is that it seems to me there is a problem in contemporary discourse um, where everyday emotions of uh, sadness or worry quickly, perhaps too quickly, start to get identified as symptoms of mental illnesses such as clinical depression, anxiety. Um, and so I think there is a, a problem for us in our modern discussions of where we draw the line between strong feelings uh, and mental illnesses. And I thought, therefore, that I'd like to take this opportunity uh, of looking again at Thomas Brown and the emotions to see what, if anything, we might take from him that can shed light on this problem of, of emotions and their relationship with, with mental illnesses. Uh, Thomas Brown, um, I've put his lectures there in the middle as a kind of halfway point between uh, the Renaissance uh, classic Anatomy of Melancholy uh, by Burton, um, which is, this, as you probably know, a huge compendious uh, text looking at the philosophy, religion, medicine and physiology of uh, uh, melancholy in all its many forms, both as an illness and as a sort of personality type. Then we have Thomas Brown in the middle, I'll come back to in a second. And then we've got the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, the, the, the standard reference work of American psychiatry, in which you would go to find a depression of, to find a definition of, of depression. 
according to modern day psychiatry. So we have, I'm suggesting this broad transition over the last 400 years from, from melancholy to depression. Um, and where does Thomas Brown fit in, in, in that story is what I want to ask here. So um, first of all, I thought I'd have a look at what he said about melancholy in, uh, in his lectures. And he defines melancholy as one of the, as he calls them, immediate emotions. So cheerfulness, melancholy, and others are immediate emotions. That means they're a response to the current situation or a response to nothing in particular. They're not looking backwards to the past and they're not looking forwards to the future. Um, and he describes melancholy as a state of mind, an emotion, a simple emotion, which even the most cheerful will feel after a calamity, but also which some people feel for most of their life for no discernible reason or as part of their uh, constitution. So that's going back to the, the ancient idea, I guess, of a sort of melancholic constitution. Although, of course, Brown has moved on beyond the kind of theory of humours that that originally was connected to. OK, so melancholy can be an emotional reaction to an event or it can be part of your constitution and much longer lasting even permanent. So I thought, ah, okay, so that second kind of melancholy, that's what we would call depression. But no, uh, Thomas Brown then goes on to say, I need not speak of that extreme depression, which constitutes the most miserable form of insanity, the most miserable disease, that fixed and deadly gloom of soul to which there is no sunshine in the summer sky, no verdure or blossom in the summer field, no kindness in affection, no purity in the very remembrance of innocence itself, no heaven but hell, no God but a demon of wrath. So that is depression, uh, extreme depression, insanity, a miserable disease. Now that is quite surprising and again shows that Thomas Brown was perhaps influential and ahead of his time in terms of categories because on the standard history of depression, you know, it, it becomes a thing, a disease, uh, much later um, around uh, the turn of the 20th century. So that's interesting to see that he has two kinds of melancholy and then separately um, depression as a disease. We, actually the kind of model that we have that we have today. Um, and then he has another way of, of, of describing the different varieties of melancholy. Um, one he describes as a sullen gloom which disposes to unkindness and every bad passion, the temper of a vulgar mind, he says. So that's kind of bad uh, melancholy and sounds again a bit like depression. And then he has a melancholy of a gentler species which as it arises in great measure from a view of the sufferings of man disposes to a warmer love of man the sufferer and which is almost as essential the finer emotions of virtue as it is to the nicer sensibilities of poetic genius. So this is more like the 18th century man of feeling, the poetic genius. And there is, of course, a long history of this association of melancholy. And perhaps it's something that has been lost more in our contemporary culture, the, the idea of the melancholy man or woman who is an intellectual, uh, a poetic uh, genius. Uh, it's a kind of model to which I and some others may still aspire from time to time. So that, if you like, is looking at the borderland of emotions and mental illness in Thomas Brown, which is uh, interesting and we can talk about. Um, and the final thing I wanted to do was look at the moral pathology of emotions in Thomas Brown. And I've said to you that to some extent, the transition from passions to emotions saw uh, strong feelings evacuated of their moral meanings and, and that strong sense of passions as the enemy of reason and virtue um, falling away. However, that was not entirely true for Thomas Brown himself, who, who did have a strong sense of how harmful um, emotions could be. And I'm going to read to you now, partly just to give you more of a, a flavour of the voice and words of Thomas Brown. I'm going to read to you um, a few sentences that he wrote uh, over the next couple of slides. These are his words uh, describing how Although the emotions can be uh, gentle and beautiful and happy things, they also compose great, great moral danger. And I assume what he's thinking about here are those states which previously might have been called appetites and the lower passions of the soul, perhaps including uh, lust and sexual desire. He says, in the picture which I have now given of our emotions, however, I've presented them to you in their fairest aspects. There are aspects which they assume as terrible as these are attractive. But even terrible as they are, they are not the less interesting object of our contemplation. They, so these less uh, fair emotions, they are the enemies with which our moral combat in the warfare of life is to be carried on. And if there be enemies that are to assail us, it is good for us to know all the arms and all the arts with which we are to be assailed. As it is good for us to know all the misery which would await our defeat, 
as much as all the happiness which would crown our success, that our conflict may be stronger and our victory therefore the more sure. And he goes on, in the list of our emotions of this formidable class is to be found every passion, so reverting to the language of passion there when he wants this moral emphasis, every passion which can render life guilty and miserable, a single hour of which, if that hour be an hour of uncontrolled dominion, may destroy happiness forever and leave little more of virtue than is necessary for giving all its horror to remorse. There are feelings as blasting to every desire of good that may still linger in the heart of the frail victim who is not yet wholly corrupted as those poisonous gales of the desert which not merely lift in whirlwinds the sands that have often been tossed before, but wither even the few fresh leaves which on some spot of scanty verdure have still been flourishing amid the general sterility. So it's really uh, poetic and colourful language. And I, I think um, some students might have enjoyed this more than others when they got up uh, to go to their lectures and hear Thomas Brown hold forth like this. Uh, so there, these evil passions uh, he, he describes as whirlwinds, gusts uh, of stale wind in the sand, uh, despoiling uh, the, the greenery and goodness of life. So a really strong sense of the fact that emotions are not all rosy and not all harmless, uh, but can be these great moral evils. Uh, and I wanted to end by contrasting that with uh, quite a lot of what we see in public messages today about emotions and mental health, um, of which this um, motivational meme is just one example. Your emotions are valid regardless of what anyone says. Um, I don't think you could have a sort of stronger contrast uh, with those words of Thomas Brown that I just read to you. Um, and we can maybe discuss what does this even mean to say that your emotions are valid regardless of what anyone says. Um, and what is the difference between that attitude uh, and the much more uh, moralistic uh, attitude of someone like Thomas Brown, but, but other people who, who wrote about the passions and emotions uh, in earlier centuries too. So that's, that's something for us to discuss. And so I just want to close uh, by recommending a few more things you might want to read if you wanted to go into more depth on these interesting contemporary uh, and historical topics. Um, first of all, there's this book by Lucy Folks, Losing Our Minds, What Mental Illness Really Is and What It Isn't. That came out this year. Um, I've reviewed it on the History of Emotions blog uh, uh, under the heading Emotions Are Not Illnesses, if uh, anyone wants to look up my review. But more importantly, I recommend that you um, get hold of Lucy's book, which is excellent. And secondly, I've just been reading A New History of Depression, The Empire of Depression by Jonathan Sadowski, um, which is very interesting on that question of how do we get from melancholy to depression? Are they the same thing or not? Um, and what changes happened, particularly in the, in the 20th century, but also looking back a bit further um, to see how modern depression was created uh, in the 20th century. Uh, I've already mentioned my uh, selected philosophical writings of Thomas Brown, if you want to know more about him. Uh, I've already mentioned this very short article, uh, Emotion, the History of a Key Word in Crisis, uh, if you want to know about the transition from passions to emotions. And if you want to know more about the history of emotions as a field in a very short book, um, my very short introduction to the topic will be coming out with OUP uh, in future. And I just wanted to end with another advertisement, which is if you want to know even more about the history of emotions and the work that we do at the Queen Mary Center for the History of Emotions, um, we have this website called The Emotions Lab. And one of the things you will find there is an award-winning podcast series on the sound of anger. So if you like to learn about history and emotions through podcasts, uh, that's one for you to add to your list. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.